All right, so let's get started now. Welcome everyone to webinar number 32. As always, a lot of stuff to cover. There are some good news from uh, decentralized economy world, which will bring it closer to how things could function um, in the way they are functioning in the world that we know today. Um, there's a lot of development that has happened. I wanna talk about it a little bit scratch the surface. Uh, it's too technical to get into the deep details. I myself well don't understand the whole technology just yet. I'm learning. We're also gonna go through the market stories, what caught my eye, and uh, also wanna talk about an option research study that I read today morning, so I included that. And finally, we'll look at some trades and do a deep dive into a company about which I kind of gave a teaser last week. Today, I have finished my study uh, over this week, so I wanna share that with you. With that, let's get going. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, as always, put it in the chat and we'll pick it up from there. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, usual disclaimer, none of things that you hear from me or you're seeing it is a financial or investment advice. This is just for education, so take it for that purpose. Yeah, so no surprises over there. Uh, the biggest winner for this week was IWM, small and medium business segments, because of the good news from Pfizer and all the euphoria in the market as if we are gonna, we're gonna go back to life as usual in all the restaurants, all the flights, airline industry, everything popped up. Uh, surprisingly, uh, when the re-economy, a reopening of economy stocks pop up, the tech sectors that have been a growth engine, you know, uh, money moved out of those uh, sectors. So we saw a rotation from growth to cyclical uh, sectors that was evident not only on Monday, but even on Friday, we saw the rotation continued. So in between it recovered from it's, the week started with, if I recall correctly, started with rotation from go, growth to cyclical, stayed that for two days. And then Wednesday and Thursday, it was back from cyclical to growth. And Friday, it was back again from growth to cyclical. And net net, I think all the sectors did end up positive for the week. And uh, VIX was really down. And somehow I feel, uh, this is my personal feeling, is that Given the situation that we have uh, in hand on with respect to COVID and uh, hospitalization rates, I don't think that the market has still uh, factored in the tail risk yet. VIX at 23 is too low from my perspective. This is where the VIX was in just before, I, I think in the mid of Feb. So we have it's like situation is back to where it was mid of Feb, but the real economy, as well as the situation in the COVID, it's nowhere near to that situation. So could there be a tail risk or maybe which market may not have, may not have uh, accounted for yet, but people also say market is forward looking. It's looking six months, nine months down the line and with an assurance that we will have vaccine um, and uh, things will return to normal sometimes next year, that's being priced in. So we'll have to see. But uh, I think pretty good week for, uh, especially for the cyclical stocks, even for the tech stocks, not, not a bad one. There were few um, stay at home stocks, uh, it wasn't good for them, but overall the tech sector, QQQ, it was, you know, it was positive, positive for the week. So we are well diversified. As I talked again and again, diversification we should have because we don't know 
when which sector will be in favor so i mean for us um, it was a good week for me so let's get this one uh, let's talk about the covid situation uh, i mean i didn't see any improvement in in the numbers uh, let's let's skip through that we all know the numbers are becoming worse day over day by day and uh, haven't seen much improvements in those numbers yet uh, that's why i'm still thinking has the market already counted for all the risk if we have to go, get into a uh, shutdown local shutdowns we already know some of the cities they have already announced those shutdowns so we got to be careful i am not going i'm not increasing my position size too big right now i'm focused on making sure that all the gains that i have had uh, i don't give it away and i'm being cautiously optimistic that's i think is the right word to say is cautiously optimistic i'm aware that markets are forward looking and uh, we saw a report from goldman sachs which is now saying market could be or 30 s&p could be 3700 uh, next by end of this year and what 4200 next year who knows uh, but we have to be cautious cautious in the market which is i think it already hit all time high this week in the middle of the week it was somewhere around 364 which uh, i think really plus given what's uh, what's the situation currently in the market Bitcoin right now it is less than sixteen thousand, but in the middle of a week it actually crossed sixteen thousand. Uh, and there was, I think, all the top currencies. It, it was a good week. Uh, I think, in a nutshell, I can say it was a good week for the crypto assets as well, along with the markets. Uh, these assets also increased. Sixteen uh, thousand was a one a key level for Bitcoin, and it crossed it. I think it has happened. first time since january 2018 and we'll talk about some of the reasons of why there it was a bullish week for some of the crypto assets and the what are the tailwinds behind bitcoin as an asset so we'll talk about that as well all right uh, so news that caught my eye was obviously pfizer vaccine Pfizer is mostly around marketing and distribution. The real work has been done by a German company called BioNTech, which is in partnership with Pfizer. And this is very common for big pharma company to, um, you know, develop medicine or or the vaccinations rapidly. They tie up with a very specialized small firms, and uh, you know, kind of an outsource. if i may use that word the development work over to the specialized small biotech companies so bioentech is the company behind uh, this particular vaccine the great news was that the vaccine was found to be more than 90% effective if we have to compare uh, i think flu vaccine is what 40 to 50% effective only and fda gen- they generally approve the vaccine if it is a uh, 50% effective so that was the reason when on monday pfizer announced the effective effectiveness of their vaccine markets were on fire some airline stocks uh, some cruise stocks they were all up by 25 to 30% i think amc uh, was up more than 60% or something it was like things going to go back to normal we don't know by the way this is going to be the first mrna vaccine ever approved for human use all the previous vaccinations they were and i'm not uh, in this field and i hated biology during my school so excuse me if i'm saying something completely incorrect but some of the other vaccines they the way they work is they'll put in a strain of virus in our body and let our immune system fight 
um, with understand the structure of how that virus is and basically be ready to, to, to fight with it, develop the antibodies. mRNA will teach the cells without injecting the strain of the virus. And this is again, we don't have to get into the details, but the fact is that it's going to be the first mRNA vaccine ever approved. And because it was the first mRNA vaccine, we also saw Moderna stock popped up because they are also working on a mRNA vaccine. And the AstraZeneca, which is a traditional vaccine, uh, their stock dropped. Okay. Uh, as we talked about, AMC was up 50%, Carnival was up 40%, and the pandemic winners like Netflix, Peloton, Zoom, they all dropped big time. Now, here's the other thing uh, that uh, we need to be aware of, which wasn't widely reported, but if you search the uh, internet for it, you'll find it is, and this always, you know, amazes me, and won't amaze me, I mean, this is how it is. Let's, let's put it that way. We have seen this thing with Moderna executives, with Pfizer executives, we saw the same thing. When the Pfizer stock popped up, I think it was up 8% or 10% on this news. The CEO of, of Pfizer had sold off 60% of its stock. Stock that he owned. He sold up 60% of Pfizer's stock. Now, I, I, I know all those sales are predetermined. He didn't take the decision of selling the stock on Monday. They have to file with SEC a form uh, in which they would predetermine the, the days on which they'll be, you know, they will be transacting. So all the designated officers of any public company have to pre-declare. But the fact that CEO would know what the date is, and then he chose to break this news very close to that date. So anyway, uh, is it illegal? I don't think so. Is it unethical? Sometimes I would think that it is on borderline of being unethical. But uh, the fact is in a capitalist society, being unethical, you know, it's uh, who cares? So we saw, we have seen similar things with uh, Moderna. When Moderna stock had popped up, I think it was two months ago or something. There were the huge stock sales that uh, the executives have done. Now we're seeing the same thing with Pfizer. In any case, Pfizer can make 50 million doses in 2020. So even if the vaccination is available, not everyone is going to get vaccinated. And we don't even know. I think US has secured 25 million doses um, and then 1.3 billion doses in 2021. So this was a good news from a biotech industry. Um, generally a vaccine, developing a vaccine takes 10 to 15 years. So we should all be proud of the scientific prowess of this company that we've been able to, that they've been able to develop this vaccine in such a short period of time. Something which is not good was the Biogen. If you remember, I talked about Biogen last week, where um, we looked at how the stock popped up because one of FDA, uh, there was a report from FDA saying they were pleasantly surprised. They saw some positive outcome from the latest results on their uh, trials for Alzheimer drug. But Alzheimer has been a very difficult problem to solve. And uh, this week, a committee recommended that there was not enough evidence to prove that the drug uh, was as effective, that could be as very effective and the stock dropped. So before the news last week, the stock was trading at around 240, 248, popped up all the way to 360. Committee's findings came, dropped down all the way to 223. So from all-time highs to all-time lows. 
this is what happens with all these uh, biotech uh, wonder drug companies. They are very, very, very volatile. And Alzheimer has been a difficult, difficult problem to solve. I was hoping that Biogen will be the first uh, company to bring a drug into the market for solving this problem. But it looks like we still got to wait. That didn't happen. Now, the official announcement from FDA has not happened yet. But if we look at a historical way, the way FDA operates, they generally go with the recommendations from the committee. They can overrule it, but they haven't seen many instances where FDA would go against the recommendations of the committee. So that's what happened with Biogen. The committee had, and that's an expert, the committee made of some experts. When they came up with a report that there's no guarantee that uh, this works in all the scenarios, stock just dropped. So while we had a good news from a Pfizer side, uh, not so good news from Biogen side or on the progress from Alzheimer. So it looks like we still got to wait to see who actually wins the race for Alzheimer. Uh, next one I wanna talk about is uh, Bitcoin. As we have seen in past few weeks, this week we saw another billionaire getting onto Bitcoin. So Stanley Druckenmiller needs no introduction. He's a very famed American billionaire. He's changed his course on Bitcoin, now saying it's got a potential to store value for future generations. He was on CNBC and was talking about he still has a lot more heavily invested in gold than crypto. He had. Um, you know, purchased some uh, Bitcoins earlier in May, and now he has added to his holdings of Bitcoin. All right, so I'll just read his last comment is, I own many, many more times gold than I own Bitcoin. But frankly, if the gold bet works, the Bitcoin bet will probably work better. Right. And then Stanley Druckenmiller is not the only um, investor. There are other big investors who are bullish on future of Bitcoin. Paul Tudor Jones, we talked about it, I think last week, Stanley Druckenmiller, we just talked about Kathy Wood. Uh, she is the CEO of ARK Investment. And uh, I think that company, it suddenly popped up into the scene or onto the scene of uh, investment management company. Let me just pull up their profile uh, because they, their funds were having superb, superb returns because they are taking huge bets on the next innovation in the world. Uh, let me just pull up ARK Investment. And they are one of the top holders on Tesla. I'll just bring up Tesla, we'll go from Tesla to ARK Investment. Ownership. All right, so ARK Investment, they have multi, many, many funds but they are the ones who came onto scene pretty quickly in the last two, three years and because their funds were you know, generating outsized returns for their uh, investors. So let's look at the current portfolio. Um, yeah, so the net net, I think the CEO of uh, ARK Investment, Kathy Wood, she's also long, you know, long time bullish on Bitcoin. So is Chamath. Again, Chamath is no is now I would call him a SPAC guy. He has got what six or seventh SPAC. Uh, Mike Novogratz is, was a hedge fund manager. Uh, I think Fortress Capital. Abigail Johnson. 
she's generally not uh, very media savvy you don't see name uh, her name talked about uh, in terms of money managers but she is the ceo of fidelity right they got a 8.1 trillion dollar of retirement investment funds uh, under right uh, by the way fidelity also um send an application for a bitcoin trust so they filed with the sec to start a bitcoin trust and of course jack dorsey from square so we see a lot of uh, institutional and the family offices and the big investment houses become you know becoming bullish so that's why it would which is segue into our next one for bitcoin it is unlike 2017 so 2017 all the interest was generated by retail investors from across the world but in 2020 all the interest has been generated by institutional investors now when i meet uh, some friends or party nobody talks about bitcoin anymore in 2017 it was the talk of the party you know um, everyone would be talking my my brother he reached out to me and some of my cousins who have not spoken to me for years they send a message to me on whatsapp hey how can we buy bitcoin none of those things have happened in 2020 but in 2020 a lot of corporates a lot of big investment houses they all have building positions on bitcoin they are more bullish than retail investors so six reasons why we saw the surge in bitcoin this year i think this year bitcoin is up maybe around 60% number one it's more demand from corporates like micro strategies square grayscale um i think almost 6 billion dollar worth of bitcoin is on corporate treasuries so that's a demand coming from a corporate sector demand coming from family offices or wealthy individuals so we got a more demand we got a lesser supply because the statistics show that all those big whales those who are holding more than 1000 bitcoins they haven't sold anything and and that's the beauty of uh, the the whole blockchain stuff is you can know you can find out if there is any movement happening if the money is moving from those accounts or not when i say money it means if the btcs or the bitcoin has moved from those accounts or not and there are companies who have built all the anal- analytics software to analyze the bitcoin blockchain and uh, all the big whales this just hodling it they're not selling it you know even bitcoin hit 16000 those big whales which means those wallets having more than 1000 bitcoins they're not selling it so the supply is less we cannot just create a bitcoin out of thin air Uh, and uh, so supply less more demand coming in basic economics work out inflation concerns uh, by money printing uh, this is shouldn't be a surprise ecb bank of england including our us fed we all feel pumping in more and more um, fiat currencies into our economy the printing press is working over time so these are i would say more economy related factors supply demand inflationary concerns but what brought in some of these institutional investors is the tech progress around custodial solutions it is becoming there i would say easier for corporates to secure the bitcoins more and more solutions are being developed on if you buy a bitcoin how you can secure it so that you know it doesn't get hacked so there are a lot of tech tech progress that have happened a lot of big known names have jumped onto this and have offered custodial solutions otherwise i wouldn't see companies like square or micro strategy you know pumping in 500 million dollars 
on a Bitcoin if they cannot secure it really well. So over the last two years, a lot of progress has happened on this. Again, resiliency shown by Bitcoin over 12 years. Uh, if it was a fraud, which this would have been kind of a longest fraud, I think after Bernie Madoff, uh, that that's been uh, ongoing. But the fact is that so many times um, there were occasions where Bitcoin should have just died, but it has not. So it has shown some resiliency. And of course, change in narrative on Bitcoin from being a medium of exchange for drug dealers, for uh, anti-social elements, for being used only in illegal activities. Now it has jumped onto mainstream. So this is a huge change in narrative. That's why we saw a lot of interest in Bitcoin in 2020. Uh, to the extent that now CNBC has started talking about it again. Uh, which now I think when CNBC starts to talk about something, maybe it's a time to sit back and, uh, you know, uh, let, let the heat go out of a market. So I now I'm seeing CNBC started reporting on Bitcoin, what's happening in this world, along as if, you know, they report about the other uh, statistics on, on the market indices. So... Yeah, fiat current is yeah, obviously fiat current is paper printing. You can print as many as much uh, I would say electronic paper because no more Fed doesn't print uh, paper anymore. Uh, they just add some zeros onto the uh, their the ledgers. Let's say the ledgers controlled by Fed, right? It's all electronic money. And with more and more proponents of MMTs, they're saying there's no harm. There's no harm in uh, Fed increasing its balance sheet and creating money out of thin air. So the concern have been that over in the coming years, may not be, you know, one year, two year, but, you know, five, 10 years down the line, it, this, this whole money printing is leading to inflationary um, practices, right? So inflation will increase. And then we have to need to hold the assets, the real assets. Gold has been the asset of choice for years, for decades. Now, Bitcoin could be another one. I mean, that's, that's where the narrative is. And again, my thought process is it's not going to be the currency. The, the use case of Bitcoin is not that I will be using it for my day-to-day -day purchases, for buying or selling the assets. Uh, it's not gonna replace the, the fiat currencies. This will become any other, um, let's say mineral or material or a precious metal to which uh, you know, we accord value. Let's take a case of a diamond. Why is diamond expensive? That wasn't the case, you know, a few decades earlier until De Beers came along. And through the wonderful, wonderful marketing, De Beers made it uh, valuable. I mean, you cannot get down on one knee and propose to your significant other, to your partner without having a diamond. Wasn't the case. But then we started suddenly putting value onto diamond. There we go. Uh, same, you know, gold doesn't produce anything. That's why Warren Buffett heard it gold because it doesn't produce anything. It's the value because we give value to gold. Now, millennials, they may not give value to gold, but they may put more value on digital gold, which is Bitcoin. So that's the reason. Again, interesting space. space. We'll continue to watch it. Uh, I'm excited about it. What else? Disney. Disney had a Mickey Mouse had a very happy moment because they reported 73 million paid Disney Plus subscribers. And the losses were not as big as what the market was expecting. So Disney was, I think it opened up 6% higher. End of the day, it was maybe a percent or 2%. 
but uh, i am long term i am bullish on disney um, the amount of the content that they have amazing amazing content and all the value at least from my perspective it lies in their this direct to consumer uh, disney plus i put more value onto that than the parks etc so even though all the parks are and most of the parks are closed california hasn't opened up florida is open with some restrictions uh, the hong kong one is open with some restrictions shanghai is open i don't think if paris is still open or not but uh, disney plus kind of save the day for the disney group as a whole they so they had 73 million paid subscribers netflix has 195 million but disney plus is what just a year old so a lot of growth uh, opportunities and potential and now this may change the way uh disney could be evaluated going you know uh, in future would would it ever be evaluated just at the same you know using same valuation metrics as netflix i don't know but it could be close so uh, that that become much more interesting uh if the whole valuation concept around the disney changes that now it is should be valued and given the same you know say price to sales ratio as netflix uh, that'll be great of course other thing is disney would forego its semi semi annual dividend in january so if you were holding on to your disney shares because it provides dividend dividend is not a guarantee and disney had decided i would say rather disney was forced to forego the dividend not decided because of activist investor um and i think that's the right thing to do they need to create and invest a lot more in building the content if disney plus has to become as successful as netflix so rather than um look giving dividend and sending money back to shareholders invest in the business they have a big growth opportunity in front of them in disney plus why not grow that i think that was the whole narrative that's why i think it is it's elliot uh asset management uh they said they took a stake and then they forced disney to not go ahead with their dividend so disney will not be providing dividend anymore how about baba baba i am bullish on baba will talk about baba as well um so yeah amy just hold on to it we'll, i'll i'll get to baba uh what else caught my eyes uh quickly Okay, through this biggest investment from Warren Buffett this year is Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, when they reported their results, we came to know that War- Warren Buffett this at least this year they brought bought back fifteen point seven billion dollar worth of shares of Berkshire Hathaway. The second biggest was their investment in dominion energy close to 10 billion dollars so this berkshire hathaways um is the biggest i would say an investment from warren buffett this year which is very unlike warren buffett because he doesn't like to buy back shares but uh, is not finding any other big opportunities i uh, still sitting even after this I think is still sitting on more than 140 billion dollar uh cash and investing such a big amount finding a company which is fairly valued or I think he's looking for undervalued companies is looking for great businesses at uh, undervalued and uh, undervalued there are not many to be found stock market is like up and up and up so there are not many opportunities available for warren buffett so now is being kind of a forced uh, to buy back its shares uh, cuz you know people have been thinking why he hasn't bought back anything uh, <clears throat> in march 
on in 2009 uh, warren buffett had invested 15 billion dollar you know some stuff in goldman sachs bank of america ge uh, this time there was no need a fed was on the side of these corporates all the corporates all the money that these corporates wanted fed provided them so no one had to go and call up warren buffett to say hey we want money and um, he couldn't get the deals on his own terms and he's a pretty good deal maker you know, most of the preferred shares that he got from i think it was bank of america or goldman sachs uh, bank of america i think that was 8% preferred shares who is going to give now 8% when fed is giving uh, loans at almost 0% so phones didn't ring he has a lot of cash being building up so he bought back some berkshire hathaway stock itself all right coming to alibaba now i'm long term bullish on alibaba but then there are short term uh, headwinds we want to talk about well let's talk about the the numbers and these numbers always amaze me right For, just from a scale perspective alibaba single day sales top 74 billion dollars and uh, i think unlike other year this is not just one day sale it's like amazon prime day which is has been extended over a few days but that that doesn't shouldn't take away the credit uh, which from alibaba in terms of how much sales they have generated so amazon prime day sale which official day was october 15th but we all know they start selling it much before it the statistics or the estimates are that amazon prime day will be you know 10 billion dollar goods were sold alibaba sales were more than 74 billion dollars and out of the 74 billion dollars 5 billion dollar were from american brands and the brands from us were the i would say constitute the biggest foreign uh, brands uh, from a sales perspective which was close to 5 billion dollar so of course it's an e-commerce juggernaut in the future biggest economy of the world right china is expected to overtake us as the biggest economy um so i am really bullish on alibaba plus the other businesses that they have the alipay which we talked about in detail last week right we know it's going through some rough weather and we'll talk about it is it's and it is not uh, you know only for alibaba any company operating in china needs to be in good terms with the government right today alibaba is in hot soup because of the tiff between jack ma and the chinese government uh we talked about how chinese government scuttled the whole alipay or let's say ant group ipo because they didn't like uh, what jack jack ma had said chinese government is becoming more and more cautious of the companies that are getting bigger and bigger um say you know let's put it that way their anti trust department is really overactive as compared to us so when jack ma said in october that um, we just don't have a good system government system around the financial uh, financial industry financial banks are like pawn shops uh, government doesn't do anything so government came and, and scuttled their ipo so recent times we have seen that chinese government will flex its muscle to reinforce that it doesn't matter how rich either you are as a person or as a company It'll, if it wants to get you it will so there's a huge article on wall street journal I, i'm sure it will be probably in other publications also but i subscribe to wall street journal so i i went through it in terms of how uh, you know the basically the unfolding of uh, or uh, and groups ipo it's an interesting read so there is always a risk if you are investing 
in any of the Chinese companies. Uh, Jack Ma used to be the poster boy for China. You know, created a company, a world class company um, from China, but now it's in a it's in you know it's not in good books of uh, Chinese government, and now we are seeing the heat. And this impacted not just um, Alibaba, but other uh, e-commerce company also. I think including Alibaba, JD.com, Pinduoduo, and some other online commerce. Uh, they all dropped uh, together almost quarter trillion dollar in market valuation because Chinese government came up with little more stricter regulations on how to regulate these companies so that these they don't become the big you know monopolies. So we we got to be careful. Uh, what's my option strategy for Baba? I am continue to stay bullish on Baba. So I I already own Baba. So and right now I have a strangle on Baba. So if it falls down below my put price, I'll be happy to own it at lower than where they were when I you know opened the trade. And uh, it's, it's a strangle, which is my short call is at above 300, I think 310 or something. If it goes to 310, you know, I won't mind letting the shares go and I'll again do a bullish trade on Baba. I'm not shorting Baba. Again, uh, when I'm talking about Baba or, you know, some of these companies, I'm talking about five years, 10 years. That's my, uh, that's my overall outlook. And then I lose options to play it every 30 days, 45 days. So I, I had, uh, I, I think I got a sh short put I had at was at 265 and I had that old trade. It's not new. I had put uh, the short put at 265 when Baba was around 320. So when it fell down, I converted the short put to a strangle by selling a short call. So, and I have more than I think $10 of a premium on it. So I'll continue to play Baba. I, I mean, these things will happen, but over a long period, uh, I think it's still got a lot of a tailwinds behind it. Uh, any other question on Baba? Cool. All right, uh, let's quickly run through this. Apple filed a new patent called Burn Bar. And uh, so essentially, this is around uh, Apple wants to grow its fitness uh, business using Apple Watch uh, and uh, connected uh, fitness devices. So from an investor perspective, we just have to see when Apple comes out with their the whole connected fitness, is it going to be Apple versus Peloton? But Apple did file a new patent around uh, you know, burn bar in which basically uh, if you are working on a machine and then on your watch, you could see how much you worked out, how much, how much of a calories, et cetera, you're burning and uh, you can compete with others. And then you see how you are performing as, you know, as compared to others. So there's a whole big detail around this whole patent filing. Uh, net net is uh, Apple wants to become a big big player in this connected fitness uh, business. So right now uh, we all know Peloton. People love Peloton, but uh, other big players Apple already was in are getting bigger and bigger. So health and connected uh, fitness is going to be a I think a next growth engine for Apple. So Vijay asked, Baba, what levels for strangle short put or call? So Vijay, I currently have a 265 short put and I think 310 call. But if you look at where Baba is right now, let's, let's pull that up. Oh, hold on, let me just bring up my thing for swim. Oh, 
All right, so this is where Baba is. So my position on Baba is, yeah, 265, 310. So I have 265, 310, December. Uh, my break even is around 253, right? And if it goes further down, I'll roll down my call. We'll manage it. But this was a trade that I had initiated long back, right? I rolled it. Uh, it was on 11.6. Uh, this is, I think, a roll on 11.6. I had a, a trade earlier than that. But if I were to do a fresh new trade uh, on this one, then essentially I would go to say 240, 235 uh, for the put side. And again, I did the naked call because I own 100 shares of Baba in my portfolio. Uh, otherwise, I won't recommend you going and doing a naked call. Maybe then you can do a put spread instead of doing a naked uh, put. So. For example, if you do this, you have a zero risk on the upside, right? Uh, and uh, let's get rid of the height positions. In this case, you have zero risk on the upside. And on the downside, your break even is what, 230? Let's say close to 230. If you are okay to, to have Baba at 230, uh, this could be one of a trade, right? It's 34 days uh, for for this trade to expire. And it's a zero risk on the upside. If you think Baba has fallen too much already and it will go back up, uh, you have a zero risk on the upside. Well, mine is, is old trade, so that's why my short put is still at 265. Okay. All right, okay, this is something I just put in for fun. I looked at a P&L statement of a company and I was like, hmm, who would like that PL statement? None of the analysts would. Only a parent can love because you know parents have unconditional love. The thing that caught my eye in this is total revenue is negative. It's not that profits are negative. It's not that it's running into losses. The strange thing is that the revenue itself is negative. Uh, any guesses? Uh, what company is this? in which a revenue itself is negative. Exactly. Steve, you got it right. It's a Royal Caribbean. So they, they had a negative revenue because uh, looks like people, those who have booked their cruises, they wanted refund because it looks like cruises are not going to, you know, by end of a year, it's not, we won't be sailing by end of a year. So all the bookings that people had done somewhere in, you know, April, May, they had a huge deals, uh, June, um, and they booked a lot of cruises, assuming that by this time, things will be back to normal. We'll start sailing those, you know, those customers, they ask for refunds. So in fact, Royal Caribbean had to pay out of pocket to refund all the money to them. That's what contributed to negative revenue. Uh, Amy says, maybe you can sell to the report. Uh, so Amy, it's up to you in terms of what's your, uh, you know, how bullish you want to be on Baba or not, right? And you could use whatever, if you're using some indicator, et cetera. If you're just looking at deltas, want to go purely delta way, then 230, 225, I think all are decent price points. Just make sure that the amount of buying, if you're going naked short put, just make sure in terms of how much is the amount of a buying power which is being used in this one. Shouldn't become too big a position for your portfolio. All right, let's skip over this. I, like I said, we'll cover whatever we could because I want to move to the other one. Let's talk about huge development in the crypto world. And uh, 
then we want to spend some time the remaining one hour we want to spend on going through an option uh, research study and then want to talk about the african diamond so crypto world uh, ethereum 2.0 uh, just to refresh your memory we talked about ethereum a few sessions earlier bitcoin store of value ethereum is an engine that powers a lot of the rest of the applications in the decentralized world consider this ethereum is a key to a world's supercomputer right all the smart contracts are created i would say when i say all means 90% there are some other competitive operating systems kind of a uh, you know competitor for ethereum but this is the biggest all the smart contracts use ethereum so now after 2014 was when ethereum work had started on ethereum now in 2020 the 2.0 version is now getting closer to reality it's still a lot of way to go the the reason why this is important is if it has to become the network for decentralized application and all the defi stuff that we have talked about it has to scale today the problem is in scaling of uh, ethereum you cannot do hundreds and thousands of transactions per second today but if it has to become the de facto standard on which all the future um transactional systems would run it needs to scale to the level wherein you can run a few hundred thousand transactions per second then it becomes much cheaper and cheaper and much faster for any of those transactions to take place today when we swipe a card if visa or mastercard would say come back and check after a minute if your transaction has been approved that's not going to work today in ethereum is running through that problem uh, and the work has been happening on it for last 4 years on to how to scale it uh, which is what the 2.0 will be there is obviously a technical challenge on you know how to reduce how much of a network bandwidth we take how to make it more cheaper to interact the it will also change the business model of how till now the, the bitcoin business model is different it's called a mining the miners earn by running through the whole mining process to create bitcoin ethereum is going to do away with that whole business model they are moving from mining to staking it's a completely new way of uh, you know let's say creating or authorizing transactions or and the incentive behind it so when this is fully implemented if any one of you have your ethereum mining gears make sure you can find other uses for it because once 2.0 is fully implemented you won't need ethereum miners uh, what are the benefits once this goes through it will allow the number of transactions to scale from high teens per second today i think it's like 20 20 maybe close to 20 transactions per second to thousands of transactions per second it will make it cheaper and then only it can support the explosive growth that we are seeing on all the innovation that is happening on the defi space and all those are actually being built on ethereum there are other competitors um we talk about there's a cardano there is a uh, a uh, neo but ethereum is the uh, the biggest of all so is it going to is this going to be reality tomorrow no there are multiple phases of how this is going to proceed and will at least take 2 3 4 years for this to finish so the the reason why i'm excited is because the phase 0 has now started which is scheduled to start on december 1 okay let's skip through the details uh on phase on december 
when they start with their phase zero, that's where they're also giving people an ability to stake their ETH and basically hold, build the whole network of who can validate. Remember, no more mining. So the way to validate the transaction is through the validator nodes. And they want at least minimum 16,000 of such nodes because it has to be decentralized. Right? They don't want anyone, any one big party to control everything. So they want minimum 16,000 validators. For you and I to become a validator, we need 32 ETH minimum to contribute to that. Then I can validate any transaction on Ethereum. So what they're starting on December 1st is the first step wherein they will provide a way for me, for anyone else to become a validator by depositing my Ethereum into a, let's say smart token. That is the phase zero. That means it also allow people like me to earn something on my ETH. Today, those, let's say Ethereum are sitting in my Coinbase account, in Gemini account, wherever the account you may have. Now, by staking this, you can also earn a yield, plus you contribute towards this whole uh, mining, uh, whole uh, validation process of Ethereum. Then the phase one will start, wherein they'll talk about the scaling, uh, and then the phase two will start, wherein they will merge the current Ethereum with a, with a new one. So like I said, it's gonna be two to four years of timeline, but it's gonna be a, a game changing um, in terms of what's happening in this world. So the stake, I, I talked about, you can stake your 32 Ethereums. Now let's look at the contract actually opened on November 4th. Right? Now, by staking, it means, uh, comparing to the fiat world, is I am taking my money and putting into a CD. It means that money is taken out of circulation. In real world doesn't happen because bank is again putting it back into the circulation. But in this case, they are not putting it back. So if more and more people are staking their Ethereum, the supply of Ethereum kind of goes down. Right. And the current calculations say that you can earn anything between seven to 14% as a passive income, but you have to be in this for a long haul. If you are deciding to become one of a validator, because when you stay, once you stake it, you're not going to take it out until this project is completed. So anyway, they announced it here. And uh, if you were active and watching this, the moment they announced that the staking contract is open, Ethereum went high because they knew now the Ethereum supply could go down because people would have started to stake their contract or stake their Ethereum into this. So quick uh, look on how many people have already staked it. So right now it has got 70, $33 million worth of Ether. People are contributing 32 Ether because all of them, they want to be become a validator. Uh, uh, we, we talked about in session one, the role that validators or the miners play in this whole blockchain economy. And uh, for it to be decentralized so that it is not controlled by any single authority, uh, they want at least 16,000 uh, validators in here. So right now, I think 2,364. Uh, people have been depositing their ETH in this and total Right now, 72,000 have been deposited. It will go on December 1st, only if they can get, oh, what happened? 524,288 ETH. So this much ETH will be taken out of current Ethereum supply, put in into that contract, purely for the purpose of bringing in Ethereum 2.0. And like I said, they're looking for 16,284 validators. If they won't meet this, uh, uh, this requirement by December 1st, 
they'll have to move out the timelines. So the risk is, could Ethereum go up? No, if we figure out that it's not going to happen on December 1st, and we don't see a lot more community interest in this, it could go down again. But again, I'm not playing this for, for just, you know, the supply of Ethereum going on. My thesis on this is long term. Uh, assuming this is the IBM's or Cray's supercomputer available for anyone to use in this world. But the key to do a transaction on the supercomputer is Ethereum token. In the decentralized world, as of today, Ethereum is the biggest computer. All the applications are using this. So I want to be in this if this will become the computer of the world. And for if I'm building any application and to use this computer, I need to pay a charge, but I don't have to pay the charge in terms of dollars. Remember going back to 1960s, if you have to use and connect to a computer somewhere in IBM, we used to pay by an hour, you know, we used to pay charges for it. So if this becomes the computer of the world and the money that it accepts is Ethereum, that's the, that's my play on, on Ethereum. Okay. So you clearly see Bitcoin is completely different use case. Ethereum is different use case. Uh, my blood boils when we will put all the coins together and say, oh, this is all cryptocurrency. It is not. Everything has got a different use cases. And none of the Bitcoin as Ethereum, none of them have a currency use case. So I, I don't even know which one could become a currency given the fact that none of the government would want to give up their currencies. So I am a, little, a lot more bearish on any uh, token which is saying, you know, we'll become the currency of tomorrow. I'm very bearish on that one. Uh, but uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum have got completely different use cases. So be really careful if you want to play in this world. Understand what is the use case behind any of these coins, right? Uh, th that's very important to understand. And there are, there are hundreds and now probably you not know, thousands of uh, these coins in which you can buy and some could just become worthless. So gotta be very, very careful. Again, it's coming here to share what I find interesting. Uh, you can make a decision on what works for you. All right, uh, let me sip some water. Meanwhile, any questions do let me know. Otherwise, I wanna talk about an option research study. And this again, uh, I see this question coming up and it's a very valid question. And uh, luckily I came across a study by Tasty Trade. I read it today morning. So I thought I will talk about it, which is around return on capital versus you know, the width of spread. It was a kind of an uh, eye opener. Uh, if you are new to option trades, and it might tell you the things, the way things look like, may not always turn out to be like that. So we'll get into it. Uh, let me just sip some water. Meanwhile, any questions, do let me know. Very quiet crowd today. Uh, still awake? Either it is too technical and, you, and everything is above the head or it is too boring. Uh, let's see if we can make it a little bit interesting in this research study. <clears throat> All right, I, I read this today morning. Again, this is a think tank. I learned a lot from them, continue to learn from them. In, and this, this again shows, right, it's such a big field that there are so many things to learn that even after you know four plus years, uh, I learn it every day. I find something every day. So market measures, they talk about return on capital and volatility, right? So return on capital for us as an investor, that's all we are aiming for, to increase our return on capital not just percentage, but you know, the overall uh, amount as well as percentage. 
over a long period of time. Right? So when you talk about options, I mean, for a stock, it's very easy from a return of capital is how much profit you're making, you divide it by the how much money you have invested in. Now, but when you're dealing with options, especially if you are dealing in margin accounts, which I believe most of us uh, probably are, the maximum return on capital, and again, everything that we're gonna talk in this is as an option seller, right? As an option seller, we get a premium upfront, so our maximum profit is already defined, which is the amount of premium that we have collected. And the maximum return on capital is a premium that we have collected divided by the buying power reduction. And now this is different from the notional value. Let's me uh, put it, uh, let's, let's take an example. And then that'll become much clearer. So let's take, uh, Tesla. So if I were to sell, uh, 20 Delta put on Tesla, say, let's say 350, the notional value for this, would be $35,000 because hey, if I were to get this assigned, that would be a 350 into 100, right? But the amount of capital, but so that's not being used for the calculation of ROC. What's being used for calculation of ROC will be, uh, this is the buying power which is being blocked. Now this could be different based on what type of account you may have. If we only have a cash account, means if you are trading in IRA, then it is gonna be $35,000. If you're trading in margin, in that case, it could be anyway, depending on how much margin you're getting. Generally, it is one fifth. Uh, so it could be, uh, you know, 7,000 or close to that. Or if it is one fourth, then it could be 8,000, 9,000. So if I were to calculate return on capital, the maximum return on capital for the Tesla trade, it would be 825 divided by 7,500, say. It's 11%, right, for next 34 days. But this is not what we're gonna talk about in this. Uh, what we're gonna look at is uh, well, something different, which, which is talk about spreads. But I'm just trying to clarify what exactly we mean by buying power reduction and how to look at ROC, return on capital. So now risk defined strategies such as iron condors are popular, especially among retail investors because it, um, we have a limited loss, the maximum loss. We already know before we confirm the trade in terms of what's the maximum loss that could happen in this trade. When we're dealing with stocks, the maximum loss could be 100%. Stock could go down to zero. But if you're dealing in iron condor, if you're selling an iron condor, you already know what's the maximum amount of money that you could lose. Don't care stock goes to zero or stock goes to infinity. But they also provide attractive ROC. So if you currently look at SPY at 20 Delta, $1 and $10 wide iron condor, the premium that you gather in $1 wide iron condor is 40 cents. In $10 wide iron condor is $3.17. So I'm close to that. Okay, let me, let me see if I can simulate this uh, particular trade to see. And, oh, this study is a few weeks old. 
so the numbers may not exactly match up but let me just try to make sure uh, if you can <clears throat> i can show exactly what they what they mean by this it's uh, bring up okay we got spy let's delete tesla don't want tesla 20 delta oops uh, i think when it was done it was maybe around 40 to 45 days to expiration so let's look at 20 delta iron condor means i am selling close to 20 delta short put and 20 delta short call we're going to the delta okay i'll pick between this one. this is a strangle so if i do this will become an iron condor with one dollar wide this is one dollar wide iron condor 20 delta iron condor collecting 33 cents right like i said this is a little old study it was done a few weeks earlier and the buying power reduction was 60 dollars in this case it would be uh, like a hundred dollars is total so buying power reduction will be 100 minus whatever 33 dollars around 70 dollars but if you do instead of doing a dollar if you do a ten dollar wide uh, means let's uh, move to 374 to 384 and 335 to 325 you could collect lot oh, oops 335 to 325 my mistake 335 this was 335 and then we buy the put back at 325 so that makes it a ten dollar wide iron condor we collect 242 as a premium so in that case it was 317 buying power was this and maximum return on capital is 67 percent in this case the maximum return on capital would be 46 percent right because you could maximum you can make and this is 317 dollars and buying power capital is 683 right? so now the big question here is why would you ever do this why not do this always and this is a, a question that got us of we also multiple times hey this looks to be much more attractive which is true looking at this trade it looks more attractive i've got more bang for my buck i was i have a potential to make 67 percent return on capital so why would i ever do this okay. so let's continue on this one uh, again the question is not just we have to look at not just this single trade but over a longer period of time so since the tie spread always can provide higher potential maximum return of capital and better loss control because it is only one dollar wide iron condor why would any trader even choose to use wider wings so let's run the back test 45 days to expiration 2005 till present means two or three weeks ago so this is based on the data which is over 15 years sold 20 delta iron condor with a width of one dollar two dollar five dollar ten dollar twenty dollar so in this example we took two examples of one dollar wide and now this is ten dollar wide but in this study they looked at one dollar two dollar five ten twenty to figure out how this thing change to find out what is the optimal width should be 
even though uh, in just by looking at this one individual trade a one dollar wide looks very attractive but if you have to do this one dollar wide iron condor over and over again for 15 years 20 delta uh, iron condor how would that perform and then why only one dollar let's look at how the two dollar would have performed how five would have performed how 10 or 20 would have performed and then the recorded they recorded the average potential max roc versus actual actual means what you ended up with so this is the potential maximum return on capital right in this i can maximum i can make two dollar 242 dollars but what i end up with is could be different what if the stock is here i could be losing what if the stock is here i would be making but less than you know 242 i would be making what 120 dollars at expiration so the comparison was what's the potential max return on capital versus actual return on capital and as an investor or a trader i would be interested in actual return on capital what i eventually end up with so interesting data although the narrow iron condors have greater potential return the realized is tells a completely different story so even though the one dollar wild looks very attractive if we, if we want to keep doing that over and over again it just doesn't work your actual return on capital is let you know half a percent same story with two dollar wide five dollar wide 10 20 performed a bit better way better than you know one dollar and two dollar so as if you increase the width of the wing your realized return on capital was better so fifth now now this is like if you're going for an interview they'll tell you you have a potential to make 50 percent of your base salary as a bonus this is what the 50 percent was but over years, if you look at a year's worth of the data, ask them to give you a salary data for all the uh, and commissioned employees, and you find that they actually end up making in 0.5%. And then another company, which tells you you have a potential to make 18% or 11%, and then you find out that the commissioned employees actually made 3%, which one would you choose? This looks attractive didn't end up being really that attractive it doesn't look that attractive comparatively but perform much better over a long period of time that's not to say that you could put an iron condor in which you have a 50 50 chance and uh, you know risk one to make one and then there are strategies which are like risk one to make one uh, but can you do that over and over again is the question so what causes this discrepancy across these strategies? Why the narrowest spreads generate the widest gap? Gap means the max potential is 51%, but we ended up with 0.5%. Why this big gap? And why do the narrower ones have this greater volatility? Oh, sorry, the answer is the volatility. Now, when we are looking at these numbers, just from a perspective of premium and the buying power reduction, we are not accounting for the volatility in the stock. And that's where the whole equation gets changed. Now, the question is, why do the narrower spread have greater volatility? Because we collect such a, so less premium that we don't have any buffer. So first, with a lower probability of being profitable, the smaller iron condors have a higher tendency to switch between being profitable and becoming losers. So the win rate is, is the least. 
for obvious reasons because i have not collected enough premium if a stock goes a little bit against me it start to lose second there were no buffer before it reaches a full loss right going back to the previous case if we had 374 375 and uh, 335 334 this is hardly any buffer if a stock just moves against me the buffer i have is just 33 cents and if a stock goes just a dollar above my short strike i'm in max loss zone immediately but if i have a wider wing i have let's say 3 dollar of buffer so zero very less buffer if you have a tighter spreads if you have a wider spread you have a more buffer because you collected more premium so that's the reason why if some of these trades are on a shorter or a tighter wick trades look very attractive from an roc return on capital perspective if you do it over and over again it may not work out and that's also uh i think this study also confirms or put more credence to the fact when someone asked me should i do more contracts or should i do wider wings so if you are struggling with uh, this question saying let's going back to tesla say you got you want you you want to put in maximum 1000 dollars in tesla right you don't want to add more cap, more than 1000 dollars so now the question that you would have is should i do 10 contracts on tesla with One dollar wide each. That means thousand uh, dollars is your maximum capital. Should I do ten contracts of Tesla, one dollar wide each, or should I do one contract of Tesla, ten dollar wide? So my answer is always go wide, do a wider uh, width because you can collect more premium and. you have more buffer and i think even though the intent of this study was not that but when i read through this i'm like oh, this also validates why we should uh give preference to wider wings and not more number of contracts even though the capital used in both the cases is same you have a much higher ability to get an actual good return on capital if you expand the width of your wings and and i'm completely with you that the 1 dollar wide wing looks very enticing because the the potential return on capital is huge you know in this case uh, the case that we just looked at in tesla it was what 30 33 percent return on capital width will be a dollar and i can make 33 dollars uh, by investing 100 dollars is 33 percent but you cannot it, it might work out once in a while but that probably will give you a false positive may not work out always again this is the back testing study i thought i found it interesting I uh, thought I'll share with you, even though <clears throat> the intent of this study was little different, but this also directly fits into the question of should I do four contracts or should I increase the width of of the spread, uh, which I get asked from you know some of you who are new and uh, struggle with this question. So here is another validation that let's do wider width. and not more number of contracts it is always good to get more premium so that if stock goes against us we are still protected so that i'll share with you 
So take away the gap between maximum return on capital and the realized return on capital is dynamic. The tighter the wings, the greater the gap. 50% to 0.5%. When in the study, when it was a $1 white iron condor, 11% and 3% when it was $20 white iron condor. Given this chart, I will always pick up $20 white or $10 white. Then doing five contracts of $2 white iron condor, I would rather do one contract of $10 white iron condor. So that's how we basically we use this. And the main reason is volatility. And if you have a tighter iron condor, there is more tendency, you will have more losers because again, when you're putting a trade, it's a probabilistic, right? It's not deterministic. It's not sure that you will always have this. It's just a probability. And when the volatility strike, you know, things could change. And if the study was from 2005 till 2020, so it has gone through great financial uh, recession of 2000. 8, 2000, so 2007 to 2009. Then it had gone through 11 years of bull period. And then it has also gone through the, you know, whatever we saw in March. So, and it has gone through the dips that we saw in 2015 and 2018. So if you want to be active and ride the, you know, rough seas or you want to prepare yourself for all weathers, not just when you know the stock is cooperating. In this case, you know, stock has gone, spy has gone and seen all the seasons. And so wider wings works better than narrower wings or more contracts. So I found this interesting. So I thought I'll share this with you. Uh, if you are struggling with that, you got a limited amount of capital, uh, you know, you want to invest 5,000, should I do five contracts, which, or should I do a wider wings? Here's another answer, do wider wings. Yeah. All right, any questions on this one? Otherwise, uh, we will jump on to what's next, the trades or the deep dive? Trades. Okay, trades. Yeah, we'll look into a trade or two that we've been carrying along for now months. Okay, Amy says for Tesla, can you write down the formula? So, uh, Amy, I'm not, I mean, Tesla just picked up uh, just an example. So, I've not even looked at Tesla in terms of should we even do the trade? in this one or not. So I don't want to um, you know, give any indication that, that Tesla is the right trade to do. So, but this is an iron condor in which, maybe I can explain what an iron condor is if that's your question, because you're new to option trading. Is in iron condor, we sell a put spread and a call spread. So when I say it sell, because I generally sell options. If you are buying, then you will buy a put spread and buy a call spread. So in this case, let's say a put spread is 335. I sell a put and then I buy a put at 330. This becomes a put spread. It is spread because my maximum risk is limited. Today, SPY is here. It could go down to 310, I don't care. My maximum loss is limited to whatever, $438. That's a beauty why, and I would recommend if you're new to option rate, always go with the defined risk, always go with spreads. So this is a put spread. Then I tag on a call spread on it. Call spread means you sell a call. And, uh, Let's say 375, 380. I get another 73 cents of a premium. 
now this becomes an rn condo so this is how you could construct uh, an iron condor it's a combination of a put spread and a call spread i hope that was what you were looking for uh, if there's anything else maybe after we're done with uh, the all the content of the session we'll open and open up the floor for q and a you can unmute and we can talk through it uh, any other questions okay so let's uh, look at some trades uh, let's bring up the trades that we have been tracking uh, in this uh, meeting obviously i can't talk about all the trades that i've been doing that will take as a full year so from august from june 6 to uh, june 1st to end of this week our success rate has been 77% net proceeds means profits uh, if nothing else if you were just watching the sessions been active and kind of a followed these trades we would have made some decent money let's talk about the trades that we closed this week uh, we talked about this one where i had a uh, covered strangle means i sold a put at 10 and then sold a call at $17.50 and uh, we did this trade on 29th i own long shares with the cost basis at 13 so if it gets called away at 17 and a half not a bad deal but uh, what happened on monday eb with this again a uh, reopening economy stock it went up high it went up all the way to 1284 this trade got auto closed um we, when we sold it we collected dollar 22 as a premium and uh, automatically bought it back at 50 cents so 216 dollars as a overall net profit you divided by the buying power capital the return on investment for this 41 days holding period was decent 33% so i still it means i still own those long shares but the cost of that long shares has come further down because i got more premium and those who are new this is how most of the time you will see me talking about my cost basis this is the way to reduce the cost basis either you get dividend if it is not a dividend paying company or even if it is a dividend paying company i will generate my own stream of dividend right i keep uh, collecting this premium and keep reducing my cost basis there are some stocks that i have in which the cost basis is now gone negative i have collected more premium than i had paid for for the for the cost of the stock so Oh, that's why I, I love, and I continue to sell option on on this one. Okay. So this was a trade that we talked about last week, uh, which I closed on ninth, when the whole market, the reopening stocks went higher. Okay. And uh, let's, oops, chat. Oh, I closed the chat window. let's talk about the the ones which we still have open so page of duty where is my pd pd uh, show positions all right so page of duty so i own 500 page of duty the stock average cost of buying the stock is 40 dollars because i bought 100 at 30 400 at 20 to 50 so average cost of buying the stock is 24 right now uh, if i look at my cost basis 
and cost basis means because I've been selling premium on this one. My pager duty, pager duty cost basis is twenty dollars twenty four cents. So pager duty can go up or down. I anyway extracted sixteen percent return by selling premium, and I still own the stock. I'm not sold the stock, but I reduced my cost basis by 16%, which is equivalent to say, hey, my, my portfolio went up by 16%. Either your value goes high or your cost goes down. Right? Now, what we also had is these two trades, which you are still carrying along. Uh, this is a trade we opened on 21st because of election volatility. And uh, that I might mention, I want to continue you know, make sure that some portion of my portfolio, if bottom falls out of a market, I have protection. So beyond, you know, $25, if, if a stock goes lower than $25, I'm protected like for 300 shares. If it goes higher, I won't mind selling it at 35. Remember my cost basis is close to 20, right? So, Selling those at 35 is a decent game. Anyway, market didn't go anywhere. These two hopefully will expire worth less. So and then I also had these two trades. Let's go back, which I had a put and a, a call on pager duty. So that means if this gets assigned, I will buy more of pager duty at $25 or if it gets called away, uh, I'll, my real price of selling this would be $34.39. Uh, and I've got two contracts and I am okay to sell it at $34.39. But if pager duty stays between 25 and this, we have a decent premium in this you know, I'll probably close it at when I'm making close to 200 or 300 bucks, which means it will further reduce the cost basis of owning these 500 shares by 75 cents. 75 cents on a $30 stock is what? Two and a half percent. So I opened this trade on 2nd of November 18th of December, what it's 45 days, close to 45 days, two and a half percent, close to 45 days, I'll do it. So that's the game plan on pager duty. And on, so other one I wanna talk about is even bright, EB. Uh, we just looked at the trade that we closed on EB. So I opened, I still own the stock of Eventbrite, B. so I sold a covered call because owed 500 shares, I sold a covered call, collected some premium. Over the last two days, stock has gone really high on Eventbrite because again, the reopening stuff on Friday, there was a rotation from growth to cyclical. This is cyclical stock. Even Bright is a company in which you can uh, create events and people can buy tickets. So if economy opens, this uh, would be good for a company. So this went up. So, but I'm okay. My cost basis is, like I said, $10 on this one or $11 on this one across all the shares. So I'm fine with it. Oh, uh, the next one talk about is Disney. We looked at Disney. I am bullish on Disney. I own Disney. I own 100 shares of Disney in my portfolio. Uh, bought it at 107. I think the current cost basis is 96 or something like that. So uh, I sold a strangle because on with short put at 130, short call at 155, gave a lot of room for it to run. Even if Disney goes higher, if I were to sell it, I'll sell it at 158. 
which is a decent amount of a return on on the disney 100 shares if it falls down i will buy it more at 126 which i am okay to buy disney at that if it stays in between because right now the earnings are out only thing uh, which could happen on Disney is if California decides to reopen, you know, if allows them to reopen the park, it might move higher. And that's why I've given it a lot more room to run up on the higher side. On the downside, I don't know what else could go wrong. But if it, uh, we'll own it at a, we'll basically get to own more shares at $126, which I am fine with. And before it starts to challenge us, we'll will basically do the management and you've seen what stories again and again, right? We'll try to manage it and reduce the cost basis further and further. So that's my play on Disney. A question from, so I think I'm done with discussing these trades. I, this week I kind of brought in two trades because EB we already talked about. I thought, let me pick up some, another ticker uh, for you this week. So brought in, Another one. Okay, let me know if any questions, otherwise we will jump on to the last session. Uh, Liz, oh, sorry, question from Amy. For PD, after the price jump in the past few days, how deal with your covered call? So I had uh, just added the trade, right now still well within my break even. My break even point is will be 1538. If it continues to go higher, I so there are multiple options, Amy. And we talked about in terms of how to manage a covered call. Um, I could, if I'm still bullish on it, I could sell a put or I could roll it uh, over to the next expiration period. So any of those things are a good problem to have because I want stock to go higher and the stock has gone higher. So. Now that would be in terms of how greedy do I want to be on event right will determine my next course of action. Most probably, let's say if it goes to 16, 17, I might look at selling some put at, you know, 11, 12. And if it continues to defy us, I'll basically go inverted. Uh, in fact, uh, this week uh, I closed another trade on Twitter where I had gone $5 inverted. And when Twitter came back down, you know, um, I closed it just for four seventy, uh, $4.70. Cents. So we made $30, $30 on a trade that had gone horribly against it. But then we tried to manage it. We went inverted, collected more and more premium. The stock is still against us, but we eventually exited for profit. So we'll basically use all those uh, management, management techniques if stock continues to go against us. But in any case, uh, this will be a good problem to have. So question from Liz, would you buy Disney out in the market or through options if you get assigned? Doesn't matter, Liz, uh, it's a, uh, if I buy, then I'll have to uh, basically buy back the put and then buy the shares uh, in in that let's say if D disney falls here at expiration then i will let it get assigned rather than you know at the end of the day it's the, it's the same trade whether i close my put if i close my put i have to pay a commission and uh, also, uh, there might be some extrinsic value still left in it. I might have to pay for that as well. And so I let it expire and be assigned to me. So any other question and option before we jump onto the last section for today, which is a deep dive. question should i buy disney as a new option so this is a very difficult answer um, because 
because uh, the question came to me privately so i won't name the person but the i cannot tell you if disney is right for you or not i don't know what other positions you may have how big is your portfolio what's your outlook towards disney uh, i am bullish on disney so i sold a put but i also want to make sure i that i could be you know wrong and uh, i want to give myself more buffer so i looked at other strike at which i'll be okay to sell went far ahead and sell 155 call from a cost re basis reduction perspective so that's why i did this trade now if you are bullish on disney and i'm bullish long term so short term disney could fall down to 120 110 i won't be hurt by that but if you would be then that's this is the trade which is not for you and if you don't even own disney don't even do this call what if disney goes to 170 the, the you'll run up into losses i am covered so if disney goes to 170 i have a zero risk on the upside but if you don't own disney if you have this disney goes to 170 you are looking at a loss of 1100 dollars so without knowing that thing you know i i can give a personalized recommendation but i can tell you what would be the scenarios uh, in which you know what could be your losses or how you can would be profitable depending on what kind of a trade it is how do you think about a leap call uh, I bought a lot of leap calls. I bought a this leap call at 2023. 20, I had a whole session. I did a whole session on leap call. Uh, I uh, let me put it this way: I don't hate leap calls, but leap calls need to be used really well to reduce the basis your uh, current cost basis for the leap calls. So I think there is a session recording on leap calls. So Amy, if you are on us. I am not sure. Are you on Slack channel with us? Then just ping me on a Slack because I did a whole session on leaps. What's the best way to play leaps? The <clears throat> because leaps are longer dated. The deltas, etc., that you see, may not always be the correct. They run a risk of uh, interest rates, but there is a right way to play the leaps, which is basically do poor man cover call using leaps. And uh, that's what you could do, or you could do the leap as a replacement of a stock. I haven't looked at these uh, uh, Disney leap call because I already had the shares. All right, uh, no more questions. Looks like so. So let's. Uh, talk about the last section for today which is we're gonna look into a company All right and now moving away from options to analyzing a business because at the end of the day whether it is options or a or a stock it's a way to get a stake in a business right so my first step is is this business good enough for me to even take a stake and that's why I go through some analysis. Uh, today, I want to talk about a company which is not a leader, but uh, it's following the footstep of other successful companies. So this is where we ended up our previous week session. Right? This company started with e-commerce business following the success recipe from Amazon. And we all know how Amazon stock has done over the past five years. Then this company also added its own payment service just like Mercado Pago. Mercado Pago is a payment services for Mercado Libre. We all know how Mercado Libre has done over the past five years. Then uh, in two months ago, they added online gaming to their e-commerce platform, just like C Limited, which is an e-commerce player in East Asia did. And we all know how C Limited, which is e-commerce plus payment plus gaming has done. And uh, a week before this uh, past week, they also opened up their logistics services, just like JD.com had done. 
So let's deep dive into this company. I call this company as an African diamond. Some of you already got it names right when we talked about it last time. It's Jumia or Jumaya. I've heard many pronunciation. Say whichever way you want to say. I call it Jumia Technologies or Jumaya Technologies, whatever. So we're gonna spend some time, uh, 20 to 30 minutes on Jumia, and then we'll open the floor for additional Q and A. All right, so let's get into Jumia Technologies. Let me bring up my deck. Okay. Yeah, I was able to spend some, some time this week to do some research so that we can talk something about Jumia Technologies. Okay, by now you know how I build my investment thesis. So quick history. Uh, I captured, you know, when I changed my sentiment around a company. So in April 2019, I was unaware of this company. This company came IPO somewhere in April. It IPO'd on NYSE at 1450 and then shot to $49 within a week. And then come May, Citron is a very famous uh, short seller um, led by Andrew Left. They published a report calling Jumia a fraud a worthless company They're saying they are cooking their books. They are making up the sales in their uh, reports. Those sales don't actually happen. So no wonder stock fell down from 49 all the way to 14 in a few weeks. So let's get back to Junior. Uh, so G M I A O charts. There's the story. Boom, up forty nine, back to whatever seventeen fourteen, right? Because of the short seller report. So then on this mid of this. Uh, Year. So I was bullish on this when it was at 14. I picked some then in the mid of year and continued looked at it at dollar nine. I was still bullish. In the recent one, I updated this talk. You know, my analysis is I'm still bullish, even after the Q3 2020 results, which uh, kind of didn't go well for investors. Stock was as 19. After the results, it fell down to 11. Now it is back to 14. But I am still bullish on, on this company, even after this fall. Okay. All right. So let's go through why, why I'm bullish. And uh, let's do a deep dive. And you could be bearish, ask questions, and we'll basically learn. My thesis could be wrong. In that case, you know, I'll change my uh, outlook. So first of all, why are we even talking about this company? We always look at what the market is operating in. It is in Africa. The overall business environment itself is very bullish, right? 1.3 billion population, 523 million internet users is the fastest growing continent in the world, which will account for greater than 50% of population growth from now till 2050. E-commerce will be 75 billion market opportunity by 2025. And in Nigeria, which is the biggest economy barring South Africa, over 40% of population is under 14 and 50% of registered voters are under 35. So more millennials and coming a generation, young generation, very comfortable with mobile, mobile, very comfortable with internet, internet penetration is still growing. E-commerce is very new. So this US, Europe are now kind of a developed, you know, growth is not too much in, uh, in these big. So other one is you go to Asia, 
Alibaba is there, C Limited is there, Latin America, Mercado Libre is there, Africa, Jumia is there. Why only, why talk about only Jumia? Let's look at some of the other people who are bullish in Africa. There is an enormous opportunity in absolute uh, numbers. Africa may be smaller right now, but online commerce will grow about 30% every year. And this came from Patrick Collison, who is a Stripe co-founder and CEO. If you have not used Stripe ser service, if you have not heard of name Stripe, you probably have used its services on many websites like Airbnb. Uh, I don't know, you know, all the new age websites use Stripe for their payment processing. So it's been the cloud number one disruptor in 2017, 18, 19, Snowflake went IPO. That's why it came at 2020 as a winner. Uh, but uh, Stripe has been, again, it was one of the uh, most awaited IPO if it happens. Not just Stripe. Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, is again bullish on Africa. In fact, he mentioned that he'll be living in Africa for three to six months. And that statement came before COVID. After COVID, you know, all the plans have changed. But Square is looking big time at Africa. Alibaba, again, they're looking at big time at Africa, right? Because they know there's too much potential in Africa when you talk about e-commerce. In anything associated with e-commerce, which is payments. That's why Square, Stripe, they're all looking at Africa. What does Jumia do? They are in multiple countries in Africa. You know, I'll, I'll skip through this mumbo jumbo in terms of improving everyday life. We support the growth of African companies. Okay, as an investor, let's jump on to what I'm interested in. What's the footprint of Africa? The whole footprint for Jumia is close to, you know, the countries where they have 600 million people, which account for 70% of Africa's GDP and 70% of Africa's internet user. So Jumia is already active in, let's say, 70% of total addressable market from e-commerce perspective today. So they are the most active player in Africa. What did they do? They got e-commerce. Okay, we don't have to talk about e-commerce. We know what Amazon does. Amazon sell goods on their platform, then they allow uh, other party goods to be sold on their platform. Jumia does the same thing. What Jumia does more than what Amazon does is they also have a payment. So they have their own payment processing platform. Like there is no Amazon, we don't use Amazon Pay, but there is Apple Pay. Mercado Libre has been a very successful story in terms of using the payment platform. So Jumia is following that footstep. They got a Jumia Pay, which is a payment services. Then they also have logistic services. And this is a brand new, they created a business division kind of uh, two weeks ago, right? In which you can, they use this not just to sell the, or to ship the goods which are being sold on Jumia website. But if I'm not even on Jumia website, I'm a third party merchant. I can still make use of their logistic services. This is what they opened a business uh, very recently, I think two or three weeks ago. Uh, when did they open it? Uh, no, 11 2. Yeah, two weeks ago. Right. So these are the three big businesses of Jumia e commerce division, payment processing, and logistic services. Right. From a logistics perspective, they are the tech and the data driven answer to Africa logistics challenges. And believe me, uh, the challenge, the logistic challenges in any third world or developing country is enormous. That's the biggest problem for any company growing their e commerce business in any developing country. There are no, in, in many places, you know, there is no set pattern of 
of addresses. In developed countries, in US, we know how the addresses would be. Is it gonna be a street number, uh, apartment number, then street, you know number two, then you find out your house number, and then city zip code. Many of the developing countries just don't have a, a standard. Every city have their own standards. Today, I can, when I have to send a letter to my, you know, or send some package to my family in India, I can write addresses in four or five ways. And it will still reach them because we got accustomed to how to read those strange uh, addresses. In, I know, you know, some of my extended family, uh, you know, you just don't have address. You can just write down a name and it's a, let's say, small town and the the, the postman still knows the people in person. It'll just reach them. So the logistics is the biggest problem. And Chumia over the years have worked hard to solve that problem for their own delivery. Now they're opening other services to anyone else, any other merchant who wants to use that. Right? So payment perspective. Not only you can pay for the goods that you buy on Jumia, you can also pay your bills. You can recharge your uh, minutes. You can buy some tickets. Right? So they're building the whole payment platform, just like Mercado Libre had done, Alibaba had done with Alipay. And very recently, in October, they added Jumia games. So they got 500 games. And now it's uh, available in five countries. This is their latest, very new business. Uh, they looked at the success of C Limited, which is again a dominant e-commerce player in East Asian countries. And they thought we want to be in, you know, we want to do that. We want to replicate the success. So they looking at the games. And the recent one is a prepaid card, which is running in a pilot. So we'll skip about it. We don't know how the pilot will go. Uh, but if this goes through, I'll add it to my thesis. So pretty bullish. Uh, I, I find this to be much bigger player than uh, the e-commerce. This means now it become a PayPal of Africa. Okay, let's look at their recent strategy. They want to grow profitable usage, development of Jumia Pay, right? That is why I, even I would want them to focus on. Diversified monetization, we'll deal deeper into it, and cost efficiencies. Now this, depending on what outlook you may have, you may call it as they shouldn't be focusing on profits right now. Right. And this is why their stock also fell down after the Q3 results is their revenue actually didn't increase as much as analysts expected. Because of COVID, they thought, hey, the revenue should grow a lot more higher. It didn't grow that high. And, uh, but their margins were much better because they are focused on growing profitably. Growth at any cost, that's not what they're looking at. So their key initiative that they did, they did a rebalancing of what they're selling. And I think this is the, sh which basically could be a short term, I would say a headwind, long term tailwind. So <clears throat> prior to this rebalancing, most 56% of what they sold were electronics phones. Now it is only 43%. The, it means the, the, the portion or, or, or the, the share of the other goods, which are more consumables day-to-day -day usage has increased. And which is the right thing to do because how many times you go and buy cell phones? You're not gonna go buy a cell phone every month. 
or every let's say every six months, but you're gonna bo- go and buy uh, you know all the fast food consumer goods shampoo regularly. You're gonna go buy your toothpaste regularly. You're gonna go and buy all others those household products more regularly. So do you may realize that they're moving their mix from just high end phones and electronics to everyday goods. But those high end phone and electronics have a high value. Whereas these goods are low value, more volume. So their dollar amount decreased and then the stock fell down, which I'm like, okay, guys, I'm looking at, you know, five, 10, 10 years later down the line. So they did a rebalancing. Operational efficiencies focused on reducing the cost. It means their fulfillment expenses came down 20%, ad expenses came down 55%. And then they exited some countries, they exited travel, no surprises, nothing is happening on travel this year. And they exited some countries where they were not profitable, simplified it, and basically G and A reduced by 24%. Their losses are coming down, which is a good thing. Uh, we talked about it. 2019, more phones and electronics, less fashion, beauty, fast moving consumer. 2020, the mix has changed, which means the average order value has come down, but the gross profit has become bigger. Okay, so future growth engines, I talked about it. I continue to stay bullish on GMAP pay. Today, it accounts for 34% of overall orders and uh, hopefully it will continue to grow. So like I said, think PayPal. So today it accounts for 24% of their gross, the overall value of what they are selling. Okay. MasterCard knew it. So they invested in $15 million in Jumia in 2019 before, uh, before their IPO. They want to be big in uh, Africa, Jumia is a player. So no matter who wins in FinTech, uh, Jumia and e-commerce will continue to win. Uh, whether it will be Stripe or it will be MasterCard, I don't know which payment processor will Jumia end up using or could it be Square? Uh, but the fact that the front end for those commerce will be Jumia, uh, this will be a biggest uh, catalyst for them. Other big catalyst, 5G. Right Now, <clears throat> The one issue about uh, African uh, you know, infrastructure is, hey, we laying the fiber optic cables, they don't have any of those things. Uh, so the internet, uh, the, the, adopt, the increase of internet, you know, they don't have an infrastructure for internet, et cetera. But if 5G becomes reality, they won't, may not even need optical cables. And sometimes these changing changes in technology works in favor of a you know, some countries which kind of uh, miss one whole generation of a technological change. For example, um, in the US, uh, you know, we had uh, <clears throat> from just landlines, we had those pagers. Anyone still recall using pagers in mean, which you get beeped and uh, then you look at the number, see who had tried to call you, reach out to you, you go to your their uh, landline phone, call that person back. In some countries, uh, especially, uh, so pagers were stayed in US for, for many years. And I recall when I was in India, while I was growing up, pagers were there for a year or two because by the time, you know, Indian infrastructure was started growing up, from landlines, we directly moved on to cell phones with a very brief period for pagers. There was no need for pagers because cell phones were becoming more accessible. 2G, 3G was coming up. So we didn't even live through the whole pager uh, era. Similarly, maybe Africa will skip some, uh, you know, that generation around how you connect to internet. Do you need to have those copper cables coming to your home? from Comcast, may not be. If 5G becomes a reality in some time, you don't need to dig up, you know, a uh, road for 5G. You need to put on uh, those 
5G terminals, and that could be a game changer itself. So who will benefit? Again, Jumia will benefit if and when those 5G become reality. Other uh, possible future uh, growth is partnership with Alibaba. You know, so they they already kind of a talking similar to this is hey we share more similarities with Alibaba as compared to Amazon, our ecosystem our philosophy and approach to attract and maintain consumer is very close that to Alibaba. They already got 1500 vendors from China and they want to attract more Chinese sellers. For Baba, if they want to expand in Africa, Jumia could be the perfect partner for them. Right? And they could get, you know, uh, either as a capital infusion because they will need capital or who knows could become a takeover uh, you know we can guess all what we want to the fact that that is a big player and then there are big companies who may want to move into that uh, area either they move in as a partner or they move in as by taking them over in either case the shares it will be good for the shares competitive strength they got a late mover advantage. We all have heard about first mover advantage, but along with the first mover, you also come with an expense of, you know, first mistakes. But Jumia had a late mover advantage. They have seen and they've learned from some of the big players in US, in Latin America, in China, in East Asia. So they've learned a lot of things. Competition, I would say almost none across Africa. There are localized players, but no one has a footprint as wide as Jumia. It is the only well-scaled e-commerce player in Africa. Okay. By the way, Jumia is, uh, is a German registered in German. Okay, I want to be very sure because if you try to look for Jumia, it is a German technology company. Sometimes, you know, some business heads in Africa Take an offense when someone calls them it's an African company because it is not, but they operate only in Africa. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, right now, almost none competition. Uh, other thing I forgot to share is now they, they also moved into food delivery during the COVID. So they added another business, food delivery. Lyft is adding food delivery to their business. So Jim is also in food delivery. Financials, I didn't look into financials. It's too early to look into financials, won't do it. So now, who else is in Jumia? Let's look at Belly Gafford. He owns, he is the biggest owner of uh, Jumia uh, Technologies. He owns 12% of this company. Who is he? His biggest holdings, Tesla. Amazon, Baba, Shopify, Mercado Libre. So this, he knows a thing or two about e-commerce. Right? What do you think? He, he's got deep pockets to reach out to the management of Amazon, Alibaba, Shopify, Mercado Libre. So we are not alone. Uh, we are standing on the shoulders of Bill Gafford, Bally Gafford. Dalit Gifford. Like I said, he knows a thing or two about e-commerce. He's the second largest shareholder in Mercado Libre. He's the largest shareholder. This firm is the largest shareholder in Jumia, second largest shareholder in Mercado Libre, top 10 shareholder in uh, C Limited. They were early investor in Flipkart, which is the biggest e-commerce player in India. Walmart bought them for $16 billion. And they have big positions in Amazon and Alibaba, as we just looked at from their portfolio. So this firm you know things or two about e-commerce and because of their relationships with these big companies, you may tend to benefit from their management expertise, right? So I would rather have company with Belly and not the reporters, which says, hey, do me have any slips as misses out on COVID boost. Oh, the fact is that the COVID boost, there was no COVID boost in Africa. Africa didn't go into lockdown as US had gone in, as Europe had gone in. So if you were comparing that, 
all the e-commerce players in Africa should see the same growth as Amazon has seen? Wrong comparison. Because there was not a big lockdown in uh, Africa. So the share went down. I thought additional opportunity to you know, go long on it. All right. <clears throat> if nothing else uh, makes you excited, this, we talked about Citron, right? Uh, who wrote a short seller report saying it's a fraud, it's a worthless. Let's look at the report. Oh, it's four, not four. It's not found because now Citron has removed it. Reason? That I find as the biggest endorsement of this company is. They call it as a fraud. And sometimes in Q3 2020, let's see what they have to tell. So now they've changed their whole narrative saying this is a disruptive platform in emerging company. How do you value it? This coming from Citron valuation saying their positioning in Africa alone should be worth minimum $7 billion or $100 per share. So a company that call it a fraud has now completely turned around and has saying this is once in a generation time opportunity to invest in the next Amazon of Africa. So this report came out uh, I don't know, somewhere in Q3. And Citron's new target is saying if companies like, uh, you know, some SaaS companies can be valued at 132 times sales. Companies with zero revenue are being valued at $5 billion. This company should at least be minimum worth. And I'm sure, I mean, they have a bright people. The short sellers have, have one of the best brains. When they looked at it, they say it should be minimum worth $7 billion, which means today Jumia is worth what? A billion dollar. So it should be at least worth seven times what they are worth today. And that's why their price point is, should be worth $100 per share. So the only way that this does not work is tech hungry population Nigeria decide that they don't want e-commerce, which I find very difficult saying Africa will be the only continent in the world or Nigeria will be the only country in the world. It says we don't have nothing to do with e-commerce. I don't want uh, any ease of, uh, you know, shipping at home. So, yeah, we talked about current valuation. My final conclusion, I'm bullish on this, uh, on this company, huge business tailwinds right now. It's not a radar for institutional money managers because the market cap is so low. His market cap is what a billion dollar. It's a uh, it's from uh, traditional um, definitions. This is a small cap company. Many of the pension funds, university endowment funds, family offices they don't invest in small cap stocks. But if it grows to become a medium cap or to a large cap, a lot more money will flow in. It will get into the lot more mutual funds, lot more pension funds, et cetera. So that's another would be tailwind just from the fact that is moving from small cap to medium or large cap. Yeah. yeah. So I am positively bullish on this. Nothing could be better than, you know, for me than to Citron to come back and say they were wrong and uh, they changed their positioning. So, well, with this, uh, I rest my case on Jumia. I am long on this. Again, for education purposes, you can do your own uh, homework. I did mine. I'm long on Jumia. I will continue to stay long on Jumia. Again, playing options to reduce my cost basis continuously so that even in short term, it goes down. I'm okay. Uh, I'm not worried. So I'll uh, continue to stay uh, in Jumia or Jumaya, whatever. So that is the end of Jumia. So let's bring some questions if you have any on Jumia. Let me look through the chat. 
uh, Citron Research is targeting Neo now. I don't think they're targeting Neo from uh, from the fact that the company is fraud. All they're saying Neo is the valuation has gone absurd, which is which is uh, I I agree with them. So it's not that Neo is fraud. All they're saying is this valuation doesn't make sense. So Liz, that's what I think Citron said, and that's the reason the Citron. That's the reason why the stock fell down from 54 to back down to, you know, 40. It, at some point of the time, it went down 19% or 16% because a Citron report came out saying it's too overvalued. So this is fine. Many stocks stays overvalued for a long period of time. Tesla has been overvalued for, from a traditional metrics perspective for months now. And so is Snowflake. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, but again, uh, from Neo, um, I think that the biggest tailwind is the battery as a service, which reduces down the cost of owning the car. Uh, you basically use battery as a service rather than owning the battery and don't pay upfront cost. So, the whole the Citron report was around the valuation, not on the comment on the business of Neo. Amy, are you planning to own a heavy position of Jumia? I already have some position. I continue to uh, build my position uh, in Jumia. Yeah, because now I have a little more conviction because I spent time in reading this. I want to make sure I, you know, I basically uh, put my money where my mouth is. So I've, I will continue to build positions on Jumia. Any news on Nanox? Uh, not recently. I'm waiting for the Nanox demo, which is supposed to happen in RSNA uh, uh, conference. So, which is between November 29th and December 5th. So, again, Nanox is, is a world changing, could become a world changing company if what they're claiming is actually true. And we'll get to know when the demo happens. Otherwise, it, it will be a fraud. If what they're claiming doesn't work, it's go, go, it'll go down to zero. Let me put it that way. So it's very speculative, a high position in NanoX, uh, but with the full knowledge that it could go down to zero if what they're claiming won't work. And we'll get to know how it happens in their demo which is end of this month, November 29 to December 5. At what price Jumia is a good buy? If I'm looking at 10 years, every price is a good buy. So, so the way I look at it, uh, I mean, if I'm bullish on a company for longer perspective and it's got a huge tailwinds behind it, then I don't look at uh, traditional valuation metrics, looking at price to sales or price to earnings. They don't even have earnings right now. That's different. Uh, but for me, today is what Jumia is at 40. I will start selling, you know, uh, I already have a position in this, a short put uh, on, on Jumia. And I think in one of uh, my retirement account, I have uh, some more Jumia. So uh, let me put it this way, at any point of a time, or, or most of the time, Amazon valuation never made sense. But right? not only one year, if you look at 10 year chart, and if you look at their, their numbers, valuation never made sense. So you could always question yourself, is it really good buy at 350, 330? So I'm looking at Jumia as a player to go long, because I missed Amazon bus, I don't want to miss uh, Africa bus. So that's my play on Jumia. So, Today price is a good price for me. If it goes to 2025, it will still be a good price for me. That's my theory on Jumia. All right. Uh, now we are done with whatever I had to share. I can, let's just stop recording and I can hang around for another 15, 20 minutes if you have any more questions. Mm -hmm.